Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, COVID update, the 23rd of August. Kim said, keep my eyes open more, I'll try. <laughs> it's just how I want, I guess I'll never be a TV announcer. Anyway, so what's going on with COVID? Well, just locally, a lot, a lot more cases. Integris has uh, about 240 to 250 people in the hospital. The other uh, hospitals in town are about, you know, and that was for all the Integra system. Everybody's running pretty much that. The ICUs are full. There's no ECMO machines anywhere. That's extracorporeal mechanical oxygenation. That's what you, it's bypass. Um, so it's what you do when someone's really sick and their lungs are filled with gook. So you put them on ECMO to breathe for them, uh, but there's no more ECMO machines. So what we're seeing in the clinic, we had an 11 new uh, COVID infections today that we took care of people in the practice. We are not doing people who are not in the practice. Okay, and also people ask this all the time. You're seeing them telemed. We're seeing them telemed. They're not coming in. <laughs> we're, as crazy as it may sound, we're not idiots. So no, they don't come in if they're sick. That would make us potentially get infected even though we're vaccinated. Get other people in the office infected who aren't, who are, aren't vaccinated. Um, people in the building, so no, they don't come in. They have to be tested somewhere else and then call and do a telemed, uh, or they send a, a patient notification via the online portal. So anyway, uh, that's a lot in a day. So again, half and half about vaccinated and unvaccinated. I, we did not have anyone that I knew of who was infected and vaccinated or infected and not vaccinated, to, prior infection and not vaccinated today. Um, I think the news coming out, so that's a lot. Uh, the people who were vaccinated seemed, um, were having pretty severe symptoms, but not ones that I was worried about in terms of hospitalization, not so much cough, but definitely fever, severe sore throat, and feeling really crappy. Um, the vaccinated, unvaccinated patients that I saw today had a little more cough symptoms. I did refer a couple for antibody infusions. I don't know if they'll get them, but, um, I referred them and then they have to meet this criteria set and we try, but it's sometimes up to the administrative uh, physicians if someone actually gets it. If they don't think they're sick enough, they may not. So anyway, that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, there was a lot on the kind of scattered information today about making everyone feel scared about ivermectin from veterinary sources. Again, um, uh, we would only encourage people to use FDA approved forms of ivermectin, whether it's for pinworms, which is what it's used for. Um, it's, it's been successfully repurposed for cancer therapy, which it's still allowed for. It's been repurposed to treat a variety of different infections that um, are determined not by the FDA, but always determined by the provider. That's FDA regulations, which they seem to have forgotten again, which they were mentioning. I'm not saying you'd use it for um, um, what's this disease called it? Oh, COVID. But uh, it is the provider's discretion on what they use the medicine for, not the FDA. The FDA does not have that type of decision making that is enshrined in their regulatory authority. They can't tell a licensed physician what how they can prescribe a FDA medicine, approved medicine. But be that as it may, a lot of noise on how potentially dangerous uh, ivermectin was. Uh, they were citing some a report out of Australia, which actually didn't show there was anything that happened. Um, so, so I don't know uh, about any of that, but the, the baloney continues. And then this is going to be something everyone's going to hear about. Um, one of my good friends sent it to me. It's a study called, and it's a preprint. And I actually don't know if this one's worthy of being printed, but it's COVID-19 projections for K through 12 schools in the fall of 2021, significant transmission without interventions. So what this group of statisticians from, uh, and systems and engineering at University of North Carolina did is they built a model based completely on assumptions about infection rates. And so they said, that and transmission rates. And so they said if we have 500 students in the setting and we have uh, one kid coming in a week who's infected um, and we wear masks and do bi-weekly testing of all the students, 
um, we can potentially lower the transmission rate between 28 and 90 percent. The issue I have with the study is they have three basic models of a 30% reduction, a 40% reduction, and a 50% reduction in transmission by using mass. We don't have data that shows that mass work in that environment. There's no data proving it works, period. So the basic assumption of the study or bias of the study is mass reduced transmission minimally by 30% to up to 50%. Um, and then when you model it out, it can reduce transmission by, you know, up to 90% over time. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. I have no idea. They have no idea because their assumptions are based on fanciful thought processes. But it just, and, and it may be right though, so it's something for us all to keep in mind. Maybe it is a 90% reduction, uh, but maybe it's a 28% reduction. Maybe it's a 0% reduction. I have no idea but it's going to be made a lot of ballyhoo about, but there's, I don't know. And then there's this whole thing with, you know, is, does one person keep on infecting? There's so many different flaws with it. It's pretty mind boggling. Plus the twice a week testing. So we're going to spend another, um, the 500 students times two or a thousand tests a week. So we're going to spend somewhere in the range <laughs> This is, uh, sorry, this is the F-bomb time. I'm not gonna F-bomb, but um, I would F-bomb. So we're gonna spend somewhere in the range uh, uh, of uh, $150,000 a week, if it was twice weekly testing, maybe it was bi-weekly every other week, so they spend $200,000 a month. I mean, you, the laws of, of common sense for a return rate on that, I don't know. So I'm just continually amazed by the science. That doesn't change the fact that I think everybody who's an adult should get vaccinated. I've been very, very clear about that. I mean, you should get vaccinated if you're an adult and you're in, a, in any group. If you're 15 to 18, I think the data has gotten very, very, very difficult to give a firm recommendation on either way. We are definitely seeing a lot of COVID in younger people. So I'm encouraging now 15 and older. Um, sorry, it's a tough situation. I went through that before, but it's really hard to put, put the data out. And there's so much noise And my, one of my least favorite people in the country, Frank Collins from the NIH actually said last week, in an interview that the noise from the FDA, the FDA data is so difficult to, to make any discernments on, they can't tell what any of it means. Uh, someone else has been saying that. I would say that also about the NIH data, and I would remind everyone that the CDC doesn't even have a, a COVID test they can offer in the United States anymore. And make sure you remind everyone of that, and that in and of itself, this little section is. Okay, the head of the NIH said the data coming out of this, FDA is so convoluted, wrong, uh, difficult to understand, they can't make any discernments on it. The CDC doesn't have a, a FDA approved COVID test because their COVID test was so bad they finally pulled it off the market. Um, the NIH has gone in circles about every conceivable thing in the world and has been wrong at, uh, over most of them. Um, not necessarily, again, still pro vaccine. I'm just saying everything else. Um, so it's a very difficult situation to know what to do with kids and the risks and the data. So that has to come down to a parent decision. I mean, I think at this point, 15 to 18, it's very, very reasonable, um, both from a sociological reason, a safety reason, and a risk of uh, getting pretty sick with COVID because people are definitely getting sick. Um, Kim, there was something else I was going to mention that I forgot because I didn't tell you and you're not a mind reader. <laughs> uh, let's see. It's not Afghanistan. <laughs> anyway, but, you know, hey, that's the federal government. Um, sorry, that was political, uh, but it was funny. I'm thinking there was something else on COVID I wanted to mention. Oh, the Israeli medicine. That's it. So CD24, it's a molecule. So it's a biologic molecule that looks like it turns off the cytokine storm. There's been two preliminary studies. 
it got seriously ill patients out within five days. It seems like it's a very mild intervention, but incredibly effective. It had a 90, but roughly a 90% response rate. It's going into a phase three trial. Very exciting news. Um, that actually looks like it could be something reasonable. It has nothing to do with our FDA, so that makes me feel even better. So it's a small, what we call a small batch molecule, so done by some researchers. They've been working on it for a long time. Uh, likewise, there's a, there's a molecule out of um, Northwestern by the head of internal medicine there, Dr. Vaughn, who's related to the Vaughns here. Big props to Dr. Vaughn. Um, which has to do with plasminogen activator. Uh, again, that looks pretty good. So there's some small batch molecules that may actually work for sick COVID patients much better than the medicine that doesn't work, remdesivir, and something that can actually stop the cytokine storm once people have progressed through um, mild disease to moderate to severe disease. That's kind of our big problem is we don't really have anything besides steroids and antibiotics that work, remdesivir, bleh, but whatever. So that's where we are with that. Remember, I've, if you have a loved one who gets sick or a friend, ivermectin was for outpatient therapy and doxycycline. I'm not saying whether you should get it or not, but I, so I'm just saying that would be the role, just like hydroxychloroquine. It, that's where it's used from a descriptive point of view, not as an advocate because that would get the post pulled. Um, once you're in a hospitalized setting, it's none of those meds matter. You have to get other stuff. Don't yell at the hospital staffs. So the hospital staffs are working their butts off. And notice there's, that no one cares about them anymore. So be nice to them. I care about them. We care about these people and they're working their butts off. The ER doctors are getting just wiped out. The ER nurses, the support staff, the ICU people, every all the people in Oklahoma City and Oklahoma and these hospital staffs across the nation are really getting pummeled. I would be careful about going to some of the cities right now. Florida's hospital system is overwhelmed. Uh, the clear data on that, I know people like to vacation there, but you always have to take that into account. Uh, whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, there is just limited hospital access. Even if you have a broken arm or something, you could have an impediment to your care. So you have to be careful about that Where when you're picking vacation spots when the hospital systems are overwhelmed. So that's it. Take care. Good night.